for us, this was the one opportunity in our careers where we knew that if we put enough into it, it was going to be a big success for all of us. It was going to be the one defining moment in all of our careers at that point. I'm Dan Gray, and I'm head of studio for Us Two Games. I was the producer of Monument Valley. Well, the concept for Monument Valley came all the way back in about mid-2013, and we'd just made a few new hires, a lot of those artists, and we started to prototype new ideas for what our next game could be. And one of the most interesting things that we came up with was uh, a visualization of a piece of architecture, an impossible piece of architecture. And what we did with that was that we printed it out and we put it on a wall in the studio. Now, our studio doesn't just have games developers in there. We only had about eight game developers out of about 120 people in that space. So the good thing about that is that we had people walk past this piece of imagery every single day and comment on it, not as game developers, but just as creative people. It looked more like an illustration. It didn't look like a game. If we have health bars and we have pixelated characters and we have scores, your average person who just wants something to escape to on the train every morning is not going to want to pick that up. Whereas if something looks like a piece of art, it genuinely looked like MC Escher was back in this day and age and creating a piece of art. It was very modern in its style. It didn't feel like any other video game that was out there at the time. And we knew that from the beginning just by the visual style we used on that first piece of imagery. We didn't even think about what it was going to be like as a game. Not mechanically. It was more about what does this make you think? What does this make you feel when you walk past it? And only after about three weeks of it being up on the wall did we know that we had potential with it and we decided to prototype it over the course of one week. We wanted the experience to surprise and delight. So then what we do with those two words is we go back to the drawing board and we think about game mechanics that really make the player feel that way. And that's where we really settled on the idea of impossibility. If we could give someone a moment every few minutes that made them gasp, we knew that we were doing something right. So when we took that into a prototype, it was, what's the most basic way that we can create impossible architecture and make someone feel like it was their power and their involvement that caused that to happen? The idea of how does it make somebody feel when they download it and they play it for the first time is the single most important factor with how we design things. One thing that we always wanted people to feel when they played Monument Valley is going into the experience being transfixed on the visuals. But actually, once we've got those players on board and they're enjoying the experience, trying to deliver them some kind of meaning that they were never expecting. One thing we had to avoid was pressures, or pressured gameplay in that sense. So no times, no scores, no enemies. Nothing that was going to make someone want to close the device and put it back in their pocket. So we knew that it had to be quite a slow-paced but engaging, puzzle-like experience. So I think the important thing to remember is we didn't necessarily want to make the thing just that we wanted. We also needed to make the thing that we thought people would love. At this point, we've already proven what the prototype can do, which is a simple mechanic of dragging cubes and blocks around a piece of architecture. And it's good. It can be fun for the, the two minutes that you play that experience. But then we need to try and figure out how that can scale. So the initial stages are without visuals. Even though the beginning, I said the, the main catalyst for the idea is the visuals, we actually pull back from that for a good amount of time during development, because we know that we can do that. But the most important thing is, now we have raised a cube up between platforms. That's one thing, put that to bed. Now we're going to have to rotate geometry to create paths you didn't know were there. That's one thing. Now we're going to have the player walk on walls. This is the first time in user testing where people genuinely said, wow, looking at this, seeing the waterfall, and then people saying, no, there's no possible way. There's no possible way I can reach this. It's, it's miles away. And then they tell you they think it's broken until they rotate it one more time and they find out it's fine. We always have to introduce a new mechanic in every single chapter that the player plays. Having that surprise in, you know, five, ten minute increments per chapter was the focus of the game and it's the thing that we needed to prove out. A big part of early development was trying to figure out what the character was going to be. And for the majority of development, it was just an orange rectangle that the player would, you know, navigate around this space. Again, we needed to think about the audience. And one thing that we found really powerful was to create a character that we thought was a blank canvas. Either the, the princess that you control in the game, 
Yes, she's a princess, but you only know she's a princess because of the silhouette of the hat that we chose and because her name is mentioned once in the game. But for the most part, she is whatever the player wants her to be. She only has a small handful of animations and a very small amount of moments in the game where she expresses emotion. What that enables the player to do is project what they want that character to be onto her. It makes that relationship between the player and the character in the game that much stronger than if we were to be really prescriptive about how we designed her and we gave her dialogue lines or we gave her more animations, for example. This is the first time you meet the crows. You'll notice they look really, really similar to Ida. And that's because we wanted the player, upon the first time you see this first crow, to know that there's some semblance of relationship between these two characters. They're the opposite of her. When we were trying to make every single level in the game, so the 10 that are in there, we always thought they needed to be summarized by a sentence or a word that made them truly unique. So I always used to think about it like how they used to name Friends episodes. You'll notice at the beginning of every single level in Monument Valley, it says the one in which X. That enables us to always think each level needs to be unique. They're all part of a collective whole designed at the same space and time, but they all need to tell it their own individual story. We were fortunate enough to have owners who trusted our creative ability. You know, they weren't investors in the, in the normal sense of the word. Yes, they were paying for our development, but they just said, guys, you have roughly one year to make a game. We're not gonna ask anything more of you, right? Just create the thing that you're truly proud of. There's no other restrictions, there's no other expectations. And yes, that's a really fortunate position to be in, but it does provide a very unique sense of pressure where you now have nobody else to blame. When we were getting towards release, we were just excited to get it out there. But the thing that most people don't know at the time is that if you're a relatively unknown developer, getting featuring on stuff like the App Store is very much an unknown quantity. You don't know until the very moment that it goes live. Nobody tells you. And that that's a really big factor in how successful your game is. You rely on that a lot for visibility, especially if you're not working with any kind of marketing budget. That time sat there waiting for that promotion to go live and seeing how many people wanted to download the game on day one was by far the most stressful but happy moment in any of our careers at that point. It was the true test of whether or not we were good enough. Looking at the rankings during that week, that's the only metric we have to see how the game is doing. It's almost like a hit list of other games you know. You see your game, then you see one that you recognize above you and you go above that one. You're like, wow, we're more popular than this other game. And then you hit another one, then you hit another one. And then before we knew it, we were number one on that chart. And we were above other things like Minecraft and these huge, massive games that are so famous like all over the world. The day of launch, we sat there with a projector that had um, iTunes just blasted across it. And we're waiting for that promotion to go live, refreshing everything all the time. We had the beers out, the champagne out. We had the rest of the company there. So not just the eight or nine people who worked on Monument Valley, but the rest of the 120 people within us two who, who didn't have anything to do with games. They were all there supporting us. And there's one particular photograph that sticks out at me. And that is the development team stood in front of that projector with Monument Valley emblazoned across the front of iTunes as the, as the editor's choice for that week. It was almost like the idea of trusting creativity and talented people gained victory over trusting in numbers and monetization and how you should do things. The BAFTA for British Game goes to... Monument Valley. Monument Valley. The BAFTA Awards are a particular highlight for us. It came quite late in development. We released the game in April, so it was, you know, another 10 months, almost a full year before we actually went to the awards. And it was the one that we still wanted to attend. Something like the BAFTAs, something that your grandma is actually going to recognize for once, is the thing that made us all happy. When you make a game for mainstream recognition and you gain mainstream recognition, that's the redemption that you, that you want. It makes you show that it's, that it's all worth it. One of the things that I most enjoy about the lasting impact of Monument Valley is we have this Tumblr blog online. It's called Monument Friends. And all it does is it just shows all of the pieces of concept art or anything that any fan has created because of Monument Valley. So it can be a cake somebody's made for somebody's birthday. It can be someone dressing up as Halloween as the totem from Monument Valley. It can be a three-year-old doing their first drawing and they're doing it of Princess Ida. That's why you create things that try and inspire people and try and give them a lasting impact.
And sometimes that's more important than the awards, it's more important than the iTunes featuring or the recognition. It's actually giving people something that they love is, I guess as creators, that's what you all try and do, isn't it?